all for coming. I wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin nations on whose land we are gathered today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, the, the Honourable Robert French AC and Mrs French, Lady Anna Cowan AM and members of the Cowan family, Chancellor of Monash University, Dr Alan Finkel AO, Victorian Shadow Minister for Innovation, Energy and Resources and Renewables, Mr David Southwick MLA, Vice Chairman Australia and New Zealand of Deutsche Bank, Mr Stephen Scala AO, President of the Jewish Community Council of Victoria, Ms Jennifer Huppert, President of the Zionist Council of Victoria, Mr Sam Tataka and Vice President Ms Shireen Hamber. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural Sir Zelman Cowan Memorial Oration. Tonight we celebrate the Right Honourable Sir Zelman Cowan, AK, GCMG, GCVO, QC, PC. <laughs> Students of history will know Sir Zelman as the Governor General who, after the events of 1975, brought a touch of healing to his Vice Regal Office and to the nation. Others will know Sir Zelman for his prolific achievements as a legal academic, university administrator and educator. He was a first class honours graduate in arts and law, a Rhodes Scholar, Dean of the University of Melbourne at age 31, of law, Melbourne Law School, apologies, at age 31, a Law Reform Commissioner, Vice Chancellor of the University of New England, Vice Chancellor of the University of Queensland, an accomplished author and a significant public intellectual. Jewish Australians in particular will celebrate the name Cowan alongside Isaacs and Monash as one of three iconic Jewish Australians to have played a starring role in Australia's national life. The themes of Sir Zelman's public life, education, the law, leadership, community and public service, resonate with the aspirations of students and of society at large. The Australasian Union of Jewish Students, Orgis, has inaugurated this oration as a celebration of that life. The oration is an annual public lecture and an opportunity for students and society to reflect on Sir Zelman's service and to hear significant national figures share their own reflections on important national issues. We fully understand that public service is often a partnership. We're privileged to be joined tonight by the partner in Sir Zelman's public life, Lady Cowan, along with many other members of the Cowan family. Justice Kirby once described the Cowan marriage as a great blessing to the people of Australia. We're very pleased to welcome you. We're delighted that his honour, the Chief Justice of Australia, will tonight deliver the first Sir Zelman Cowan memorial oration. The themes of the Chief Justice's own impressive public life intersect strikingly with the life and work of Sir Zelman Cowan. Finally, we take the opportunity to remember the late Right Honourable Malcolm Fraser, ACCHPC, who as Prime Minister recommended Sir Zelman as Viceroy and gifted the Cowan's talents and energy to Australia's highest public office. Please join us in viewing the following film and then in welcoming Mr Stephen Scala to introduce the Chief Justice and to invite him to deliver his oration. Sir Zelman Cowan was a giant of a man. His record of achievement as a legal scholar, educator and public intellectual has few parallels in Australian life. As our nation's 19th Governor General, he set a standard that is the benchmark for all those who have followed. His reputation was impeccable, based on a life lived with honesty and integrity to a degree that is seldom found. Sir Zelman's life and work won equal plaudits from both sides of the political divide. He was always above the rancor of partisanship. But it was the private man who was so special to those who had the privilege of knowing him. He was humane and decent, humble yet proud. I vividly remember my first meeting with him and Lady Cowan and Stephen Scala more than two decades ago when his humour and wit quickly put this young boy at ease. One could not find a more loyal and caring friend, deeply interested as he was in the well-being of others. He mentored many of the young people who gravitated into his orbit. Each sought his wisdom and advice, which were always dispensed with the generosity of spirit. Age was no barrier to friendship with Sir Zelman, for he would elevate you to his level making you feel comfortable in his presence. Sir Zelman's intellectual brilliance and firm moral compass were equally matched by a deep sense of his own identity. It is said that to know where you are going, you have to know where you come from. Sir Zelman knew this. He was proud of his immigrant background and his Jewish faith, and he never sought to distance himself from his heritage 
during his long and distinguished career. Given all that Sir Zilman was and what his legacy represents, it is only fitting that the Australasian Union of Jewish Students has established an annual oration in his name, covering such important themes as civic responsibility, leadership, justice and Australians' engagement with the law. I am honoured to be the patron of the oration and offer my sincere thanks to the Honourable Robert French AC, Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, for agreeing to deliver the inaugural address. I am sure the evening will be a great success. Thank you. Sir Zellman came to office when the role of Governor-General in the fabric of our political system had been placed under enormous duress. He rightly identified the need for a touch of healing and through his wisdom and dignity delivered it. The healing continued throughout his four and a half years as Governor-General where he sought to interpret the nation to itself and recognise those whose voice was not always heard. There have been just 25 Governors-General since the advent of Australian nationhood in 1901. None has served with more distinction than Sir Zelman Cowan. Sir Zelman was a seeker after truth rather than an expounder of dogma. And perhaps, Mr Speaker, one way in which we could further honour his memory is by seeking the ethical principles which might be regarded as common to all cultures and to all people. Principles such as keeping commitments, respecting human life and caring for the vulnerable. So Zellman sought always for the things men and women had in common and hoped always that they might be their best selves. He was above all a natural teacher. Now, he, it, it, this is an important point because many teachers and scholars of Zellman's rank, Sir Zellman's rank, find teaching students a little bit beneath them and prefer to leave that to their assistants and concentrate on research and giving grand lectures. But his enthusiasm and passion for other people, particularly for young people, marked him out as a really special teacher, somebody who had not simply the intellect, not simply the charisma, not simply the ability to communicate, but also the compassion and the genuine human interest in others. That is, that's remarkable. The, the great scholars who, of whom you could make those observations would form a relatively short list. Stephen Scala has been Vice Chairman Australia and New Zealand of Deutsche Bank for the last 11 years. He was previously, for almost 20 years, a senior partner and head of the corporate and commercial practice of Arnold Block Liebler. Mr Scala was educated in law at both the University of Queensland and at Oxford University and was Vice President of the Australasian Union of Jewish Students between 1973 and 1977. Outside the law and commerce, Mr Scala has served on the boards of several well-known Australian organisations, including currently as a board member of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Deputy Chairman of the Walter and Eliza, and Eliza Hall Institute for Medical Research and Deputy Chairman of the General Sir John Monash Foundation. He has been the Chairman of the Australian Centre for Contemporary Arts and Film Australia and has also served on the board of the Australian Ballet. He is still Chairman of an ASX listed public company. In 2010, Mr Scala was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia in recognition of his services to commerce, education and the arts. Please join me in welcoming Mr Stephen Scala. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Chief Justice and Mrs French, Chancellor of Monash University, Dr Alan Finkel, Lady Cowan, distinguished guests and friends, one and all. For this inaugural Sir Zelman Cowan Memorial Oration, I'm delighted to have been asked to introduce our guest of honour and speaker today, the Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, Robert French. The Australasian Union of Jewish Students' decision to honour perpetually the distinct legacy of Sir Zelman Cowan, one of our truly great Australians, 
through this means is appropriate and wise. The fact that a jurist as distinguished as Chief Justice French is giving this inaugural speech adds luster and distinction both to the occasion and to the memory of Sir Zelman himself. For the Jewish community, this oration will help to perpetuate Sir Zelman Cowan as the successor to General Sir John Monash and Sir Isaac Isaacs. All were men who transcended politics and religious affiliation to play vital roles in Australian public life. They did so through the sheer force of their abilities and their shining personal qualities. I was one of the young students mentored by Sir Zelman. We were friends for more than 40 years, and I can confirm and echo Josh Frydenberg's remarks about him in the introductory film. He was born in 1919, on the day that Alfred Deakin died. Zelman Cowan was destined to be steeped in the law, the constitution, and the proper discharge of public office of the highest order. As you heard, he was a Rhodes Scholar. He was also a Vinerian Scholar and the recipient of an earned doctorate in civil laws from Oxford University. Now this is the rarest and most distinguished academic legal qualification in the world, achieved only by those regarded by the Oxford professors as being a person who is authoritative in a given area of legal scholarship. Now, Daniel Nash has recounted that Zelman Cowan was the 31-year-old Dean of Law at the University of Melbourne. He was also a visiting professor at Harvard and Chicago law schools. It is said, rightly, that he created the modern law school in Australia. He became Vice-Chancellor of two universities. In 1977, he was appointed Governor-General, and he carefully showed a nation shaken by the constitutional crisis of 1975, that the core institution of governance of the Commonwealth was effective and worth having. On his retirement as Governor-General, he became provost of his Oxford College, Oriel. Now, Zelman Cowan was a great legal scholar. One of his numerous interests was in chief justices. He knew a remarkable number of them. He wrote celebrated books about two of them. Sir John Latham, who was Chief Justice between 1935 and 1952, and Sir Isaac Isaacs, who became a member of the High Court in 1906 and its Chief Justice in 1930, before becoming the first Australian-born Governor-General in 1931. Sir Zellman considered Latham was a good, but not great, Chief Justice and took issue with Latham's well-known dissent in the Communist Party dissolution case. He also noted Latham's private advisory relationship with Prime Ministers Lyon and Menzies, and his friendship with Richard, later Lord Casey, during the course of his Chief Justiceship. Interestingly, Sir Zellman also took issue with Isaacs, but not over the law, but over the question of the establishment of the State of Israel. Isaacs, a deeply committed Anglophile, was against it. And Zelman Cowan supported the great Professor Julius Stone's powerful arguments conducted through the Jewish press in favour of Israel's establishment. Zelman Cowan knew that a full academic life meant action as well as contemplation and reflection. He led many great debates on issues as diverse as privacy, tissue transplantation, the rights and responsibilities of the press, and civil liberties and the rights of the individual. In 1967, the then Professor Zelman Cowan produced and narrated for ABC television the Yes case for the referendum that returned Aboriginal Australians to citizenship in their own land. Now another referendum affecting Indigenous Australians is foreshadowed. We can hope that others, perhaps some of you in this audience, will emulate Zelman Cowan's example of how leaders in academia can enrich public debate with measured contributions based on a vision for incremental advances in justice. Like in Sir Zelman's career, we can discern in the career of Robert French an attention 
to one of the enduring justice issues of Australian history. In 1973, Robert French played a central role in establishing the Aboriginal Legal Service in Western Australia. He worked for many years with Aboriginal people in establishing noteworthy health and legal services. It was not surprising, given his interests and his dedication, that as a judge, Chief Justice French became the inaugural president of the Native Title Tribunal in 1994. Robert French is Australia's 12th Chief Justice and our first Chief Justice from Western Australia. He's a graduate, first in science and then in law from the University of Western Australia. Again, like Sir Zellman, Chief Justice French's intellect and wisdom were recognised early. He was appointed a Justice of the Federal Court in 1986 at the relatively tender age of 39. During his judicial tenure, among other appointments, he served as a Deputy President of the Australian Competition Tribunal, as a part-time member of the Australian Law Reform Commission, and as President of the Australian Association of Constitutional Law. Robert French succeeded Murray Gleeson as Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia in May 2008. Chief Justice French has a distinguished record of dedication and extraordinary achievement in support of good and worthy causes. Given the times and his achievements, there is little doubt that his work indicates a man both of principle and courage. As a legal practitioner, Robert French built a legal practice renowned for its voluntary and pro bono legal work and for taking to a new level the traditions of our legal profession in using its skills for the good. Chief Justice French also has an abiding interest in education. Among many other notable achievements, he served as the Foundation Chancellor of Edith Cowan University between 1991 and 1997. Now, the Chief Justice is the leader of one of the world's preeminent courts. The Australian High Court has often been regarded as a model for standards in the quality of its judges, in the quality of its judgments, and in its tone and in its thought leadership amongst judiciaries. In this sense, Chief Justice French has been a standard bearer, not only in his judicial pronouncements, but also in the range and thoughtfulness of his extrajudicial speeches on a wide and important range of topics. Today, the Chief Justice will speak about ethics and public office. This is a matter about which he has made tangential reference in previous addresses, including in a speech entitled Public Office and the Public Trust, given as the seventh annual St Thomas More Forum Lecture in 2011. He touched upon reasoning in the development of fiduciary and associated equitable obligations and discussed the proper characterisation of similar obligations for public officials. It will be intriguing to hear how, Chief, how the Chief Justice's thoughts on this most substantial of subjects are evolving. I invite Chief Justice French to address us. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, Chancellor, Lady Cowan and the uh, very extended Cowan family uh, and uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Zelman Cowan was a man of special measure and it is my pleasure to deliver this oration in his memory. Uh, his life is too well known and the stories of it too often told in a variety of ways and in a variety of forums for me to repeat them tonight. It was a life of high achievement. It was also a life of public service. As a scholar who enriched our understanding of the Australian Constitution, as a teacher, as an educational leader, and ultimately as the Governor-General of Australia. He occupied that great office as a man with a deep appreciation of the Constitution and constitutional practice, uh, coupled with a matured experience of public life, a man fit to receive the great formal lawmaking and executive powers attaching to the office. The lawmaking power derived from the function of the Queen as part of the Parliament under Section 1 of the Constitution and his function as her representative under Section 2, and the executive power 
derived from section 61 of the Constitution. Zelman Cowan also understood the third branch of government, the courts, which exercised the judicial power of the Commonwealth. In 1959, he published the first edition of his definitive text on federal jurisdiction in Australia. The second edition of which he co-authored with the late Professor Leslie Zines in 1978, and the fourth edition of which is now in preparation by a friend of mine, Geoffrey Lindell. Deep understanding and matured experience are invaluable attributes to holders of public office, but they mean little without an ethical framework. Zolman Cowan's life of service was conducted within such a framework, and it's the idea of ethics directly relevant to the exercise of public office that is the subject of this oration. The search for a workable ethical framework for public office does not require an extended philosophical inquiry covering great ethical thinkers from ancient Greece to the present time, although the duty to exercise public power in the public interest has been recognised by philosophers going back to Plato and Cicero. A modest but workable ethical framework can be anchored to the purposes for which public office is conferred and its nature as an office of trust. With that anchoring, the ethical framework should be one upon which most people who understand that we live in a representative democracy governed by the rule of law can agree. In that context, may I say that I recently received a very nice letter from Sir Zolman's son, uh, Rabbi Dr Shimon Cohen, attaching a transcript of a conversation he had with my predecessor, the Honourable Murray Gleeson, in September 2011, which was in part about the role of judges in applying the law. It presents a particular example of the general argument. In the opening paragraph of the transcript, Rabbi Cohen put to Murray Gleeson the proposition that there is a concept of universal ethics which ultimately arbitrates ethical human conduct. He asked him how the application of the law took such universal ethics into account. Murray Gleeson responded with a typically careful answer. The idea, he said, of a level of justice over and above the positive law is widely accepted, but its practical implementation requires care. In his view, the enforcement of law by the courts is subject to an obligation of what he called legitimacy. Now that's an important term when it comes to thinking about ethics in public office. It must, of course, be defined because otherwise it simply remains what we might call a conclusionary epithet. And it is, of course, defined. The ordinary meaning relevant to this talk of the word legitimate is conformable to law or rule, lawful or proper. It therefore imports, so far as judges are concerned, all the requirements of their office, including diligent attention to their tasks, honesty, fairness, impartiality, independence and competence. In the context of public office holders generally, the idea of the word legitimate directs attention to the purpose for which their office was created and its powers conferred and the conditions and limits attaching to the exercise of those powers. Those purposes, conditions and limits define a working ethical framework. Now it is not my idea or anybody else's idea of universal ethics, but universal ethics are above my pay grade. The, university, the universe is a large place and the repository of many mysteries. An ethical framework for public office holders defined by the purpose for which their office was created does not require the underpinning of any particular religious tradition. Indeed, explicit attachment of the ethics of public office to such a tradition may undermine its legitimacy. In the context of the Christian religion, Professor Max Charlesworth, a Catholic philosopher, once wrote that Christian and non-Christian alike have to make do with the ordinary ethics of human inquiry. So too Andrew Dutney, Professor of Theology at Flinders University and past President of the Uniting Church, said that there is no more a Christian ethic distinct from all other ethics than there is a Christian mathematics distinct from all other mathematics. In an obituary for Zolman Cowan, published in the Australian newspaper on the 10th of December 2011, he expressed pride in his religious heritage he found it difficult to believe that there was not some original creator. But what flowed from that he did not know. Importantly, he observed, I try to live decently, contribute decently, because that's the right way. 
consistently with his own view of a right way, it's possible to make some very basic propositions about public office that accord with the idea of legitimacy and the idea of a public office as a position of trust, attracting fiduciary obligations, reflecting those which are actually imposed by contemporary administrative law. It should also accord with the principle of the rule of law and a larger conception of the relationship between the state and its subjects. The basic ethical proposition is this. The holder of a public office must discharge its duties and exercise its powers for the purposes for which the office exists and for which the powers are conferred and only for those purposes and according to the conditions and within the limits of the power. Now that is a rather minimalist proposition. It neither inspires nor uplifts. But it corresponds generally to legally enforceable rules and necessarily encompasses such notions as honesty, diligence, fairness and rationality. It is not unduly restrictive because it can accommodate the legitimate exercise of public power through a wide range of widely defined purposes. It permits whatever can be done lawfully by public office holders. The choices they make may involve at a high governmental or parliamentary level the formulation of public policy and its reflection in legislation or giving effect to such public policy through administrative decisions. In a larger and more contestable ethical framework than that which I have proposed, judgments can be made about whether policy or administrative decisions are good or bad. A parliamentary policy reflected in legislation fixing certain tax rates and social welfare benefits may give effect to what some people regard as a fair and equitable distribution of community resources. Other people might regard the same choice as unfair and inequitable. The basic ethical framework attaching to all public office can accommodate conduct which people can judge as right or wrong according to some larger ethical perspective, but not as an unethical abuse of public power. By way of example, the Australian Parliament is given very wide lawmaking powers. It has the power under section 51 of the Constitution to make laws for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth on the various subjects which are set out in that section. That is a familiar form of uh, provision conferring constitutional powers on parliaments. It does not limit the lawmaking power by reference to a criterion of peace, order and good government. It does not authorise the High Court of Australia to strike down a law on the ground that it is not for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth. That judgment, for better or for worse, is a matter for the Parliament and ultimately for the people to whom the Parliament is accountable. There has been some debate in some cases in New Zealand and the United Kingdom about the possibility that there are some restraints on that widely expressed lawmaking power by principles deeply rooted in our democratic system of government and the common law. However, no law has been disallowed in either of those countries or in Australia on that basis. The purposive approach to the ethical exercise of public power is not as arid of traditional concepts of good behaviour as its bare formulation might suggest. It is connected to and enhanced by very old ideas about public office as a species of public trust. And that in turn is connected to the idea of a fiduciary relationship, a concept of private law. There is a strong school of thought that the idea of fiduciary relationships underpins the ethics and in some cases the law of public office and public power. Fiduciary relationships in private law include those which exist between a trustee and a beneficiary or between a solicitor and a client. They are relationships of trust. The law imposes enforceable obligations on those fiduciaries and those obligations are derived from the doctrines of equity which were developed in the Chancery Courts of England and transported to Australia in the 19th century. They were succinctly described by Professor Sarah Worthington in the following terms. Equity insists that beneficiaries are entitled to the single-minded loyalty of their trustees, or more generally, that principals are entitled to the single-minded loyalty of their fiduciaries. Put starkly, the fiduciary duty of loyalty requires fiduciaries to put their principal's interests ahead of their own. It requires fiduciaries to act altruistically. 
translating that statement to public office in a representative democracy, a public office holder acting ethically would be required to be loyal to the people whom he or she serves and to put their interests ahead of his or her own, a proposition which applies to parliamentarians, ministers and appointed officials, including, of course, judges. Supporting these positive requirements are prohibitions. Fiduciaries must not place their interests in conflict with their duty as a fiduciary. They must not use their position as a fiduciary to personally profit. This idea embraces that of the trust. And Murray Gleeson, whom I mentioned earlier, spoke of judicial office as a fiduciary office, at least in an ethical sense, when he said in a speech delivered in 2000, judicial power which involves the capacity to administer criminal justice and to make binding decisions in civil disputes between citizens or between a citizen and a government is held on trust. It is an express trust, the conditions of which are stated in the commission of a judge or magistrate and the terms of the judicial oath. He characterised the High Court as an agent of the Australian people, entrusted with the responsibility of ensuring observation of the federal compact and signifying that fiduciary character in which it exercises its power. So with this private law analogy of the trust and the fiduciary relationship in mind, it's time to place our topic in the larger context of the relationship between the state as a whole and its subjects. <clears throat> in a speech in honour of Sir Zolman in November 2014, Peter Varghese, the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, quoted from an article written by the young Cowan in March 1939 in the Melbourne University student newspaper Farago. The article was about the impact of dictatorship on national culture and it included the following statement. The state exists as a convenience for those who compose it. That sentence which greatly interested Varghese and certainly interests me points in the direction of the general idea of the state as having a relationship of trust with respect to its subjects. The Commonwealth of Australia, brought into existence by an imperial act but based upon a popular referendum and embodying principles of representative democracy and responsible government, was created as a state for the benefit of the people. The idea is not spelt out in terms in our constitution. It is nevertheless a powerful idea informing the way in which we view the ethical and legal obligations of those who on behalf of the state exercise public power. <clears throat> there has been much written about the idea of the state as a whole acting as a fiduciary. In a comprehensive monograph on the topic by Associate Professor Fox Dacent of McGill University, he treated the relationship between the state and subject as one built upon the necessity of trust. Generally, as he pointed out, a fiduciary is somebody entrusted to make judgments and to exercise powers that the beneficiary is not entitled to exercise. One example is arbitration. Two parties authorise an arbitrator to settle a dispute between them. Neither of them can undertake the arbitral role because neither can be both judge and party. And as a Professor Fox Dason went on to say, more generally, this is exactly the circumstance presented by the fact of sovereignty under which legal subjects must entrust the specification, administration, adjudication and vindication of their rights to the state. Private parties have no authority to make the judgments or exercise the powers necessary to determine such matters. They do not get to make laws that apply to others or decide legal disputes. Courts have acknowledged the idea of a public or political trust, although not generally as something which itself can be given legal force. Sometimes it has been argued that governments owe legally enforceable fiduciary duties to Indigenous peoples. Now that argument has been considered in the United States, Canada and New Zealand and was considered by the High Court in Mabo and the State of Queensland. Generally, where governments in the United States and Canada have been found to owe fiduciary duties to Indigenous people, those duties, legally enforceable, have been based upon particular statutes. And there is a provision in the Constitution of Canada that affirms existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of that country. In a case decided in the Supreme Court of Canada in 1990, the Queen and Sparrow, the court referred to a general guiding principle derived from that constitutional protection, namely that 
the government has the responsibility to act in a fiduciary capacity with respect to Aboriginal peoples. The relationship between government and Aboriginals is trust-like rather than adversarial, and contemporary recognition and affirmation of Aboriginal rights must be defined in light of this historic relationship. There is also a line of cases in New Zealand which establishes the existence of a fiduciary relationship between the Crown and the Maori people. In Mabo, the people of Mur Island in the Torres Strait argued that the state of Queensland had a legally enforceable fiduciary duty to them in relation to their rights and interests in land on their island. That fiduciary duty, they said, arose from their particular historic relationship as part of the state of Queensland and previously as part of the colony. They claimed that Queensland was therefore bound as a trustee to recognise or protect their rights and arguments. Queensland showed what it thought of that proposition by passing an act trying to extinguish their rights and interests while the Mabo case was still before the courts. That is, a, as it were, to pull the rug from under their feet. The High Court found that the Act was unconstitutional in a decision known as Mabo No. 1, which was decided in 1989, because it was inconsistent with the Race Discrimination Act, not because it involved a breach of fiduciary duty. In the event, in the Mabo litigation, the general proposition of an enforceable fiduciary duty to Indigenous people did not find favour with the High Court, except with Justice Tui, who founded it upon the power of the Crown to extinguish native title. Coming back to this notion of public trust, which is closely related to the idea of Indigenous uh, duties, the Australian Constitution only uses the term public trust once, and it is in section 116 of the Constitution which provides that no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust under the Commonwealth. Now, that term public trust has not been explained by the court. In a decision given by a single judge of the court in August 1950, Justice Fulliger, he found that members of parliament hold, quote, an office or public trust under the Commonwealth for the purpose of section 116, but he didn't distinguish between the concept of office and the concept of public trust. In an article about that uh, section, which was published in the Melbourne University Law Review in 2011, it was suggested that a single public office can properly be characterised as both an office and a public trust for constitutional purposes. The notion of a fiduciary relationship between a state and its people as a legally effective constitutional principle is not really part of Australia's legal or, traditional consti uh, uh, legal or constitutional tradition. The idea of the fiduciary relationship can, however, inform an ethical framework defining at a theoretical level the relationship between the state and its people generally, and feeding into the more particular relationship between the holders of public office and those who may be affected by the exercise of their powers. Let's move away then from the large abstraction of the state to the idea of the individual holder of public office as a trustee. That has a long history, um, and in the, in the law it goes back to the 18th century in a case called Bembridge where public officials were described as holding offices of trust concerning the public. Uh, that description reflected by what Justice Paul Finn, who has written extensively on the field, uh, called the circuitous route by which English judges brought public officials into a fiduciary relationship with the public. Now, this idea of a trust-like or fiduciary obligation was applied with some legal bite to individual members of parliament in the 1920s by the High Court of Australia in two cases, Horn and Barber and uh, King and Boston. Now, Mr Horn was a land agent engaged by Mr Barber to sell a property to the Victorian government. The land agent engaged Mr Deeney, a member of the Victorian parliament, to act as a lobbyist for the sale, promising him a share of the commission if it went through. Mr Deeney made some representations to the relevant minister about the virtues of the property, but did not tell the minister that he was acting in the matter as a commission agent. A dispute then arose between the vendor of the land and the agent about the land agent's entitlement to commission. And the Supreme Court of Victoria held that the whole commission agreement was illegal because of the involvement of the parliamentarian. The High Court, which upheld the Victorian Supreme Court's decision, 
emphasise the obligation of members of parliament as an aspect of responsible government and upheld that, that decision that the Commission agreement was void. Sir Isaac Isaacs, of whom you've already heard mention, said in his judgment, again emphasising this notion of responsible government and the role of the parliamentarian, when a man, I suppose if they only thought in those gendered terms in those days, when a man becomes a member of parliament, he undertakes high public duties. Those duties are inseparable from the position. He cannot retain the honour and divest himself of the duties. One of the duties is that of watching on behalf of the general community the conduct of the executive, of criticising it and, if necessary, of calling it to account in the constitutional way by censure from his place in Parliament. Censure which, if sufficiently supported, can mean removal from office. That is the whole essence of responsible government, which is the keystone of our political system and is the main constitutional safeguard the community possesses. So here you have this vision of the notion of the role of the parliamentarian from a man who was critically involved in the drafting of our constitution, which of course, although it was based on the US constitution, embodied that critical difference of responsible government. The law, he said, would not sanction the circumstance when the personal interest of a member of parliament could lead him to act, quote, prejudicially to the public interest by weakening his sense of obligation, of watchfulness, criticism and censure of the administration. Now, there is, of course, an obvious tension between that obligation and the party system, in which members of the party in power tend to support the executive of the day, as demonstrated by the Dorothy Dix questions that make question time sometimes so boring, at least in between the other ones. Just as Rich, in the Horn case, reasoned expressly in terms of a trust relationship. So he said, and this was a different approach from Sir Isaac Isaacs, members of parliament are donees of certain powers and discretions entrusted to them on behalf of the community, and they must be free to exercise those powers and discretions in the interests of the public, unfettered by considerations of personal gain or profit. So much is required by the policy of the law. Any transaction which has a tendency to injure this trust, a tendency to interfere with this duty, is invalid. And as he pointed out, courts of equity in dealing with transactions between private persons have always avoided, as contrary to the policy of the law, purchases by trustees from themselves. This, he said, applies with greater force to public affairs and the obligations and the responsibility of the trust towards the public implied by the position of representatives of the people. A similar statement were made by the Justices of the High Court in the Boston case, which was decided three years later, in which a Member of Parliament was charged with conspiracy, it being alleged that he'd agreed to receive payments as an inducement to use his position as a Member of Parliament, again, to secure the acquisition of certain lands by the Government of New South Wales. Uh, Justices Isaacs and Rich wrote together and described Members of Parliament as public officers, and they quoted the definition of office in the Oxford Dictionary of the Day, which included, quote, a position of trust, authority or service under constituted authority. The practical importance of this public trust metaphor waned for a while in the 20th century as specific mechanisms were created for the oversight and accountability of public officials. However, as Justice Finn has pointed out, a loss of faith in some of those mechanisms in the late 20th century led to renewed interest in the public trust and its implications for officials and for our system of government. So you'll find in codes of conduct for public officials at many levels, the trust or fiduciary concept is invoked. And uh, in provisions of the Independent Commission Against Corruption Act of New South Wales, for example, you'll see a reference to breaches of public trust. It should not be thought that the concept of membership of the parliament as an office of trust with legal as well as ethical stru strictures has gone by the board. Sir Gerard Brennan, a former Chief Justice of the High Court, in a speech made in 2013, referred to what he called the long-established legal principle that a Member of Parliament holds a fiduciary relation towards the public and undertakes and has imposed upon him a public duty and a public uh, trust. He says, the limitation demands that all decisions and exercises of power be taken in the interest of the beneficiaries and that duty cannot be subordinated to or qualified by the interest of the trustees. A breach of the duties of elected office 
that was so outrageous that it was almost comical, came before the House of Lords in England in 2002 in a case called Porter and McGill. The Conservative Party had control of the City Council. The leader and deputy leader of the Council believed that people who owned their own houses were more likely than Council tenants to vote Conservative. So they established a policy under which the Council would sell 250 Council properties a year in eight marginal wards. After receiving advice that targeted sales would be unlawful, the policy was revised to increase the number of sales to 500 right across the entire city, but still including the 250 sales in the marginal wards. The Council's auditor, to whom the matter was referred under the Local Government Finance Act, found that the Council had adopted the policy with a view to achieving electoral advantage for the majority party. He found that the leader and deputy leader were party to its adoption and implementation knowing that it was unlawful. And he certified that those responsible for the policy, including the leader and deputy leader, had caused the Council to lose approximately £31 million. That finding was upheld in the House of Lords. Lord Bingham, whose little book on the rule of law has become something of a classic, set out the relevant legal principles. He referred to what he called a general principle of public law, that statutory power conferred for public purposes is conferred, as it were, upon trust, not absolutely, that is to say it can validly be used only in the right and proper way which Parliament, when conferring it, is presumed to have it intended. And importantly, he added, it follows from the proposition that public powers are conferred as if upon trust, that those who exercise powers in a manner inconsistent with the public purpose for which the powers were conferred betray that trust and so misconduct themselves. This, he said, is an old and very important principle. And here we see expressed a link between the ethical idea of discharging responsibilities in exercising powers for the purpose for which they were created and viewing the office as a trust. Administrative law is the field of law which is concerned, of course, with the exercise of public power and the bases upon which it can be called into question in courts of law. And it largely embodies that basic ethical framework to which I have already referred. And there has indeed been considerable writing to the effect that the approach of the courts in challenges to particular exercises of public power are very similar to those that they would approach challenges to the exercise of discretion by a trustee or fiduciary in a private law case. Another former Chief Justice of the High Court, Sir Anthony Mason, wrote that administrative law from its earliest days has mirrored the way in which equity has uh, regulated the exercise of fiduciary powers. And Lord Wolfe, the Master of the Rolls in England in 2000, compared public officials to fiduciary power holders, saying much the same. Now, examples of that kind of observation about administrative law can be multiplied, as well as cautionary observations against stretching the analogies too far in a way that might be dependent upon contestable assumptions about sovereignty and the sources of constitutional power. Given the examples which I have mentioned of bad behaviour by parliamentarians in the 1920s and local government officials in England more recently, it's perhaps important to emphasise that the fiduciary obligation is not just about what fiduciaries should not do. They have positive obligations and must have the freedom to discharge them without being second-guessed on the merits by the courts. Professor Charles Samford, who um, edited a collection of um, essays uh, in honour of uh, uh, Sir Zolman, made the point uh, in arguing uh, that trust law can make a positive contribution to constitutional law. He said it's primarily positive. A trustee is given powers in order to advance the, benefit, the interests of the beneficiaries. In so doing, he pointed to the cautionary parable from the New Testament of the servant who buried the talent with which he had been entrusted. The trust or fiduciary metaphor has been said to provide a bridge between ethics and the law. And Professor Fox Decent, in the book I mentioned, Sovereignty's Promise, argues for a connection between law and morality in the light of fiduciary principles. It's nevertheless important to recognise that while the duties imposed on public officers resemble fiduciary obligations, the court do not, generally speaking, impose such obligations directly upon them. To do so might risk in, uh, too interventionist an approach by the courts. 
Now, the basic ethical framework which I formulated at the beginning of this paper does little more than set out the requirements of much of administrative law today. If you take the simple case of a single official exercising a power under an Act of Parliament, it might be a power to grant a licence or, or a visa or to revoke one or to deport someone or let them stay. There's a vast array of such powers in our society under Commonwealth, state and territory laws and delegated uh, laws. In such cases, the decision maker will comply with the ethical framework and with the requirements of administrative law if he or she acts according to what I call the logic of the law under which the power is conferred. Now that requires these things, that the decision is made first according to a reasoning process, that is it's rational, even if it involves the exercise of a value judgment. It's consistent with the statutory purpose. It's not directed to some other purpose which is inconsistent with the statutory purpose. It's based upon a correct interpretation of the statute. It has regard to the matters which the statute requires to be considered and it disregards matters which the statute does not permit the decision maker to take into account. It involves the finding of the appropriate facts or states of mind which are conditioning that power and it doesn't depend upon uh, speculation or inferences which are not open or findings of fact which are not supportable by the evidence. And it results from the application of processes which are required by the statute including requirements of procedural fairness. Taken together all of those things require diligent attention by the decision maker to what is necessary to discharge the public office task. They are utterly inconsistent with bias or dishonesty in the discharge of that task. Ethics and the law coincide in this area. The ethical obligation can be generalised into a kind of promise keeping for neither the law nor ethics requires the public officer to do more than what he or she has impliedly promised to do by accepting the office to which he or she has been appointed. And in some cases as we know that promise is made explicit by an oath of office. So what this oration offers is a bare bones statement of the ethical requirements of a public officer. Of course any public officer may exceed those ethical requirements. There is a phenomenon which we sometimes call acting above and beyond the call of duty. There are many extraordinary individuals who do just that and Zillman Kahn was one such. His life demonstrates to us all that the basic ethics of public office impose no limit on the levels of selfless commitment which may be given to public service. He was an extraordinary individual and with all of that an exemplar of the ethical public officer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dean Sher, National Chairperson of Orgis, and this is Sam Myerson, Victorian President of Orgis. Uh, and uh, we would like to thank you again all for joining us here tonight. Uh, we would like to take this opportunity to give another round of applause for the Chief Justice, who gave, uh, before you do, um, who gave a very moving and inspirational and I think certainly timely and, and, and pertinent talk tonight on ethics and public policy and public life. Uh, and we thank him once again for being the speaker at this, the inaugural Sir Zellman Cow narration. Can't see you. Uh, Chief Justice, if you could please join us up here on the stage. Um, we would like to present you with a gift. Uh, which is a copy of Sir Zellman's biography. So, there you go. Thank you very much. Uh, as you all have heard tonight, Sir Zellman Cowan was an incredibly inspirational and uh, exemplary figure in our society. He was a giant of public life and leadership, uh, a token of community service, and a champion of justice, and a fine example for all as aspiring leaders. 
And as student leaders, we're very proud to be here uh, and to be at the inaugural Sir Zalman Cowan uh, oration. And we couldn't think of a more fitting gift for our speakers. So thank you for your very moving speech. Now, we'd also like to call up Stephen Scala. Uh, Stephen gave us uh, a very thoughtful and, and interesting and, and relevant introduction tonight. And uh, we'd like to present you, Stephen, with a copy of uh, Ally by Michael Oren, the uh, current member of the Israeli Knesset uh, and former Israeli ambassador to the United States. Thank you. Finally, if Lady Cowan could please join us up here. Lady Cowan, on behalf of Orgis, we would like to thank you for your patronage and for making this evening possible. Whilst we are here to honour Sir Zelman, we could not honour him without honouring you. This year you were recognised as a member of the Order of Australia for your significant national contributions in many different areas. You are truly an inspiration and we thank you for being here tonight. Just the Australasian Union of Jewish Students uh, is very proud to have launched this new and I hope you agree compelling addition to the community calendar in honour of the late and great Sir Zelman Cowan. We greatly appreciate the support of Lady Cowan and the entire Cowan family, many of whom are here with us tonight. We also greatly appreciate uh, the support of Josh Freinberg, our patron, uh, who gives his apologies and, and his wonderful video message. And of course, uh, we'd like to acknowledge Monash University. Uh, there could be no more fitting, given Sir Zellman's contribution to education, his passion for it. There could be no more fitting venue for the Sir Zellman Cowan oration. Uh, and uh, we thank the Chancellor, who's here with us, um, for, for his hospitality. Orgis has been the representative body for Jewish students since 1948 across Australia and New Zealand. We continue to provide meaningful Jewish experiences to tertiary students both on and off campus. Tonight is just a showcase of the kinds of events Orgis is capable of. We pride ourselves on offering a plethora of different events for our members and we seek to empower students to continue developing their Jewish identity after school. Finally, uh, we would like to acknowledge all of our many student volunteers and staff uh, for their, uh, their contributions tonight. In particular, our oration chair, Daniel Nash, uh, whose, whose hard work, um, certainly not just on this oration, but throughout Orgis for the last seven or so years, uh, has been very much appreciated. And uh, just a round of applause for Daniel's work tonight. <laughs> We just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to all of you for attending tonight and we hope to welcome you back again next year. Uh, if everyone could please remain in their seats whilst the Cowan family uh, and Chief Justice and Lady French uh, depart, that would be great. Thank you and good night. Yeah.